Well, I ditched the shoes. I got the first song in. Um, it comes from an old thing that I used to do when I was at Bible school. And it was, um, we were studying the Old Testament. And oftentimes when people encounter God, uh, one of the things that God says to them is, is take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. You kick off your sandals. And it would have been much easier with Richard's shoes. Um, Birkenstocks and socks that are nice and warm would have been smarter. I wouldn't suggest following me in that tradition here. The floor is awfully cold. Um, but today we are continuing a series that we're doing on the Lord's Prayer. I always said that if we're going to put something in the service every week, we should maybe figure out why it's there. And um, prayer is especially important because it's about our relationship with God. Who is this God we're talking to and how do we address him? And um, we're going to talk about being on holy ground. Um, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. We're going to do the holy is your name part today. Um, but I want to start with some facts about uh, the Grand Canyon. So the Grand Canyon is 277 miles long. It is up to 18 miles wide at its largest spot. It's a mile deep. And that's what it looks like. Knowing all of that does not prepare you for what it's like to be in front of it. If any of you have gone there, has anybody gone to the Grand Canyon? When you stand before that thing, you suddenly realize that you are small and that God is an incredible creator. It doesn't capture the grandeur of it. Um, in a similar way, like to say that the Grand Canyon is all of those numbers or all of these things uh, would be the equivalent of basically saying the Sistine Chapel is just a big church with a whole bunch of paintings on it. Uh, and that's what that looks like. But when you stand before it and you see masterpiece upon masterpiece upon masterpiece, something happens. You get very, very quiet. It reminds you that you're not that big in the big scheme of things and that God is much bigger than we give him credit for. Um, Rich Mullins has this line in one of his songs that's uh, it's a great song. I was listening to it on the way here. And it's, it's not, we're not as strong as we think we are. It's a humbling thing. I went to a Bible school with a beautiful sanctuary. It was about as tall as this. It had better stained glass down both sides. And I got to give tours of the building because I'd been there a while. And we'd have guest groups come in. And one of the things we do is give them a tour. And I always loved walking them into the chapel. Because no matter who it was, whether we were talking the craziest youth group you've ever seen. Or like business executives from Microsoft. You walked them into the chapel and something happened. All of a sudden, everybody started whispering. And I learned to stop doing my explanation of all the windows and everything, and to let this moment of walking in and being quiet and encountering the fact that we were in front of the everlasting God, to let it just sit there for a minute and impact people. And then we could talk about it and figure out what it is. Um, This series <clears throat> teaches us to pray. Um, last week we talked about how we have a Heavenly Father. A Father who is perfect, who is close, who is more loving than we ever gave him credit for. And uh, Jesus was the one who introduced this. No Jewish person would have ever prayed, Our Father, Daddy. And yet to think that we have a loving Father who is perfect, who wants to be close to us, who wants to be near to us, it, it, it's kind of mind-blowing. We don't quite get it. Um, and in that same line, our Father, we get, holy is your name. And it literally translates, Lord, let us not forget that your name is holy. Let your name remain holy among us. Um, and we don't hold those two things very well. I, 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 I have a very hard time holding the closeness and friendship and love of God and the holiness of God at the same time. And, and I think other people do too, because... The people I know that seem to get the holiness of God the best have a really hard time grasping how much God loves people. And I, on the other hand, know that God loves people. But I think um, if you had spent enough time around me, you would find that I might offend people by being a little bit irreverent sometimes. Because I'm close. Um, so Jesus puts these two together. For him, it wasn't a tension. Um, holiness and his love. A big, powerful king of the universe, God, who wants to be our closest friend. 
And the word holy, um, it literally means set apart, a cut above, different than us, not even in the same realm. The two can't sit side by side. Um, picture LeBron James and me playing basketball one on one. Now, I can work on my basketball skills, but were I to play him a hundred times, I would be shocked if I ever got a point. It would be because he sneezed, and at that exact moment, I was able to get a shot off. And there is little that I could do over many, many years to close that gap at all. He would always be on a totally different level. And if you've ever had a moment where you encountered how big and how powerful God is, um, it would have done the same thing that it did to those guests who walked into the chapel as it would be to me try to play LeBron James. It would quiet you and make you realize that you are not in the same realm as this guy. It's sort of like standing there and watching a hurricane or an earthquake. I grew up in Southern California. We had a few earthquakes. Earthquakes are funny things. You know, we have these buildings. They're so sturdy. And when an earthquake happens, you realize how fragile everything really is. Uh, things that were unshakable are suddenly shaking. Um, if you ever see a hurricane, you go, wow, that stuff we built was not all that impressive. Um, the Bible has a story like that. It's, it's Genesis chapter 11. The story of the, the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, Jesus, or God, had said, spread out, subdue the earth, go everywhere. And mankind said, nah, i got a better idea. I'm going to build a city, and we're going to build in it a tower. And that tower is going to be so high, it's going to be a magnificent thing about what we can do. And we're going to build a tower that goes absolutely up to heaven. We're going to be the same as God. We're going to just work our way up there. And um, Genesis 11, 5 says this. But the Lord came down to see the tower. He says, let's go down and we'll go see this thing that they're building. And that one verse kind of goes, God has to act, make a decision to actually like go down and see this little tiny thing. Imagine kids building Legos and they think they have made a perfect, amazing tower. Um, it's a humbling thing become, to come before a big God like that. I want to read Isaiah 6. Um, once again, Will is saving us time because he gave me bookmarks that I never used before. And I would wander through the scriptures looking for things on a Sunday morning, but no longer. Thank you, Will. And Alyssa. And Alyssa. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Alyssa gets the credit. I always give it to Will. I'm sorry, Alyssa. Um, here was Isaiah's encounter with God. This is, this is how it struck him. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook. The temple was filled with smoke. And how it strikes Isaiah is this. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The angels were covering up their eyes because to look on God was to be killed by His holiness. Because we and God cannot exist in the same space by God's holiness. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away. Your sin is covered over, atoned for. Without Jesus' grace, without his mercy, without him taking away our sin, we don't get to be in the same space as God. Our God is that holy. Um, Job. Here's how God's holiness struck Job. Uh, Job, if you know the story, he's a man who was put to the test. Um, the devil decided to crush him and to prove that he would not stay faithful. And Job is absolutely annihilated. Like the book starts with Job just getting crushed. Like his health, his family, his buildings, his wealth, everything is taken away from him. I'm, I'm picturing his insurance agent just sweating bullets as claim after claim after claim comes in from Job. Uh, and then his wife, who's, a, who's really a gem, comes alongside and says, um, you know what, Job? 
at this point, you would be better off cursing God and, and just committing suicide. Um, when your wife tells you you're better off dead, you are not in a good spot. Um, and then his friends, who, who are really just, uh, well, they have the bedside manner of a drill sergeant. They come alongside and they go, you know what, Joe? All the stuff's happening to you. I know you think you're righteous, but you must have done something really bad. Like, God is fair. That's the one thing we know. And so you must have really, really, really blown it this time. And they're trying to get Job to come around to say God must be fair in doing all this stuff. And Job is, is trying to defend God, trying to defend his own position, and trying to make sense out of all this bad things that are going on. Um, the book of Job is really about that. Can bad things happen to good people? And it appears they can. Um, but then in chapter 38, verse 1, it says this, And then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. God spoke. After 37 chapters of theological debate, trying to figure out what God is like, God says this, who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you, and you are going to answer me. And the next two chapters are God questioning Job. And I want to share a few highlights. And these questions are not designed to be answered. They're designed to remind Job who God is. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I marked off its dimensions? Did you ever order the sun to rise? Do you know what the gates of death look like? Did you lay out the stars and place its constellations? Have you ever provided prey for a lioness? Have you ever led a bear or her cubs from one place to another? Did you give the horse its strength? Did you give the hawk its wisdom and its wings? All these things that we study in science that are absolutely breathtaking, God made. And then he basically says to them, surely Job and his friends, you can judge God, you know his ways, you could have probably done this better than me, couldn't you? And listen to how Job answers. He encountered a holy God. I'm unworthy. I can't even reply. I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. I spoke twice, but I will say no more. And shut up. He let God be God. And he recognized that God is much bigger than he is. And that God is in charge. And it's actually better when God's in charge. There are times in our lives and in prayer when it is time to stop talking. Stop asking to quit telling God our will and to simply sit and know that God is God. He's large and in charge. He is just and he is good. And even though life might be going absolutely sideways like it did for Job, he's got things under control. While we're remembering that God is close and that he loves us more than we could ever conceive of, we must not forget that God did not shrink and lose his power in the process. He's still the king of the universe. The request to ask God to keep his name holy is actually a request for us to remember that God is indeed God. It's to remember the potency of the one that we walk with. It's to remember that we are small. And it's to remember that he's actually better at running things and for us to actually leave him in that spot. Um, one of the things that happens with us is, is we have a tendency to think we're the center of the world. We do it with other people all the time. Uh, it's one of our, our least awesome traits as human beings is to put ourselves right at the center of things. And we think about ourselves more than we think about probably anything else. And Similarly, like human beings at one point thought that everything revolved around the earth. I mean, the sun revolved around the earth as well as all the other planets. And then um, we came to realize that actually the sun was at the center. And we need that to happen in our spiritual life. We need to remember that we 
orbit around God, not the other way around. And when this happens for us, uh, a whole new relationship with God opens up. At camp, we would do, um, the last day we would give kids a chance to share, like little testimonies. It was a really, really special time, especially for us counselors. And um, I remember this kid getting up, and he'd come to camp for a couple years by that point. And he was maybe 10. And, and his testimony was so awesome, and it stuck with me now for 25 years. He got up, and he said, when I first came to camp, I learned that I could pray and I could ask God for anything. And so I, I asked God for a new stereo system and a Nintendo. And now that I've been here a couple years, I now kind of ask God to do what he wants to do in my life. He figured out who was at the center. And then suddenly he was a part of a much bigger story than his own life. Just to stand before the Grand Canyon can remind you that you're small, as walking into a cathedral will remind you that you are before the king of the universe. Let your name be holy reminds us that God is there and much bigger than we give him credit for. Um, we don't merely pray to a buddy Jesus. Uh, I had a shirt, this cool shirt, it said Jesus is my homeboy. I liked it. Uh, he is my, my closest friend without a doubt, but sometimes in the midst of thinking he's my closest friend, I, I start to picture him like this, and, and this is the picture of Buddy Jesus. If you don't know Buddy Jesus, <laughs> that's Buddy Jesus. Um, that is from a little movie called Dogma, uh, and in Dogma it's kind of a religious satire, and um, the Catholic Church is trying to renew its image and, and make itself more relevant, and they've decided that Jesus brooding on the cross is not an image that's very appealing, and it doesn't show the supportive, pick-me-up nature of Jesus. And so, um, as part of their campaign, Catholicism, wow, you got the centerpiece, which is the new and improved buddy Jesus. Um, when we speak of God's love and friendship and support, it is really easy for us to go, well, that's my buddy Jesus. Um, but we forget that he's in charge of the universe. He's got a very big plan, and it is to restore and redeem and save the world. And we stand before an incredibly awesome God. So what do we do with standing before an awesome God who invites us into his living room and says, you're my kid? Well, besides maybe shutting up on occasion and letting God be God, I think what it does, most of all, is it reminds us that God is a rock. He is the one thing that cannot be moved. He is much bigger than our circumstances, and he's much bigger than we are. And what that means is that if we build on him, we get what Psalm 40 describes as lifting us up out of the miry clay, putting our feet on the rock. That was my experience of coming to faith. I tried to do life all sorts of my ways, most of which led me into murky Spots, And then I put my life on God, and when I do that, I find solid ground underneath me. Christina shared about my friend Chris Perry, who is probably a couple years younger than me, and has just passed away. And in the announcement that he had passed away, um, his wife said something really lovely. He said, um, send us cards of your memories so my kids can get to know him through your memories. But I know that someday, soon. We will get to see him as well. Chris and his kids' story isn't over because God is such a solid ground that death can't even stop that reunion from happening. His wife will be with him again because God doesn't let death overcome things. There is solid rock. The Proverbs say, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what that means is... Um, when you start to figure out that God made the world and us and life and everything in it, wisdom means getting your life in line with him. And when you do that, solid rock appears underneath you. But it also means that when you don't, you end up in what the Proverbs call foolishness, which is deciding to oppose God because you'd rather do things your own way. Um, one of the things that happens when I'm writing sermons is I sometimes get a little distracted. I'm a little ADD. And especially when you're working on a computer, there's this thing called YouTube that creates silly videos all the time. 
and I'm pretty sure that it's one of the devil's tools to distract me from actually getting my sermon done. And I stumbled across these videos, and what they were is of people wrestling with bears. I was curious if that's even a thing. I had heard rumors. Apparently, people wrestle with bears. Maybe it started in Russia. I don't know. These guys get in a ring, and they wrestle with a bear. And people have actually won these wrestling matches. They have pinned the bear for three seconds on its back and won. But here's the thing. Everybody knows it. The guy wrestling, the bear, and everyone watching knows that the bear is playing. He's doing what dogs do. Like, they wrestle with each other, and we have two dogs. One's bigger than the other. And if Shasta decided to take down Gabby, Gabby would be mincemeat because she's smaller. But mostly Shasta just puts out its paw and, like, whacks it a little bit, and they keep playing. If the bear were to get serious, like, let's say the wrestler was in between mama bear and cubs, and the bear didn't want to play, things would get very messy very quickly. When we order our life in such a way that we disregard God, who he is, and how he calls us to live life, we are putting ourselves in a ring with a bear who will one day stop playing. At one point, at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, Matthew 21, Jesus says this, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in his eyes. And he's speaking of himself. And then he says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. I don't want areas of my life to be fruitless. And I certainly don't want areas of my life to be crushed. Um, God is the rock and we are not. But there's another part of God being a rock that struck me this week that's even maybe more important. And it is that in praying and coming to a God who is much bigger than we are, um, we find refuge, solid ground. I grew up in Ventura, California. It's right next to Santa Barbara. Or, uh, and um, right now, California is, is, is in a world of hurt. There's been massive fires that absolutely torched everything that was on the hillsides. And then they got California rain. And California rain is different than Seattle rain. California rain uh, comes in like deluges and tremendous amounts. Seattle rain is like this mist that surrounds us from October to May that we can't seem to get out of except for an occasional day like this. Um, when California rain comes, things move. The ground starts to shift, especially if there's no plants in it. And so, mudslides. When there are heavy rains coming, and there are mudslides starting to happen on the hillside above you, you um, get a call to evacuate, and what you don't do is you don't sit there and say, well, I hope it works out. I'm just going to keep watching TV. You don't go to your neighbor's house and go, hey, how about we hang out here instead because this will help us not get hit by the mudslide. Um, what you do is you find a place that's not going to get swallowed by the mudslide. And you go there. You call your friends in Northern California. You leave town. You drive into the desert. You go anywhere that the mud is not going to come. In life, we will face storms. <clears throat> but God is large and in charge. He's solid rock. He's up on a higher spot than we are. That's a really good place to be in the midst of a storm. Um, in Mark chapter 4, the disciples are in a boat with Jesus, and he, he's sleeping. And a, a, a big storm comes up. And they're trying to, to keep the boat from capsizing, and Jesus is still sleeping. And, and so they, they wake him up and say, God, don't you even care that we're about to die? So Jesus gets up. Tells the waves to be still. Tells the winds to stop. And suddenly, it is calm. And it's funny, in the midst of the storms, the disciples do exactly what we do. They wonder if God cares. What's interesting to me about that story is God wonders why they're afraid. Why don't they trust that he's got them? No matter what squall might be raging around you, no matter what is going on in your family, work, health, or friendships, 
There is a God who sets things right in his own timing, in his own way, but he can do it with a word. The wind and the waves don't get the last word in our lives. They don't. He does. So run. Run to the Father who loves you. Run to the God who is holy and powerful. Run for the high ground that is still the best ground to be on in every season of your life. I've talked a lot about stormy days. You ever got a high ground on a sunny day? Today would be a great day to not necessarily be in church, but to be hiking. And I, I'm betting there's some people right now who are about to get out for a 10 o'clock service and they're going, yeah, no. I gotta get to high ground. I wanna go somewhere. I'm gonna climb that peak. And when they get up there, it is gonna be an incredible view. When we run to the Lord, when we take the high ground, when we go up to this higher place where God is large and in charge, the views are incredible. Life gets rich and abundant. The Chronicles of Narnia, fantastic series. Um, or as I remember one person saying, what a great set of movies C.S. Lewis did. I hope he does another one. Um, it ends with this. It ends with them uh, going into, following Aslan, going into Narnia, and, and they, they have this refrain. They say, onward and upward, to Narnia and to the north, onward and upward. May that be the story of our lives. May we go onward and upward into higher and higher places because we have a God who is holy and loving and invites us to be with him. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are not just our buddy, that you're not just a compassionate friend who's there to listen to us in our time, but that you are a holy God, that you are large and in charge and that you will have your way. And thank you that you are good because your way is good. Help us to set our lives in line with you. Help us to be people who stand on solid rock rather than get crushed by solid rock. Lord, we give our lives to you. We trust you. Help us to do so when we don't.